Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. This iPad looks almost identical to this one. And on the surface, the difference between the two isn't very obvious beyond the fact that this one starts at $449 and this one starts at $599. This is the 10th generation iPad and this is the fifth generation iPad Air. And while I've been using the Air a ton over the last year, I get a lot of folks asking me about which iPad is the right one to buy between these two. So I went out and bought a 10th gen iPad and I've been doing a ton of comparisons over the last few weeks. It turns out there is quite a difference between these two. So if you're wondering which one is right for you, if the price increase in the air is worth it or what accessories to consider, stick around and let's get into it. All right, so both of these tablets look almost identical when it comes to the actual iPads themselves. Same button placement, pretty much the same form factor with a few minor variations. The color options are the most noticeable on the Air. You've got a more muted color selection where the regular iPad has much brighter colors. I'm actually not a fan of most of the regular iPad colors, but I do like the blue, which is the one that I have here. I'm not a fan of the pink and the yellow is just it's not doing it for me at all. My iPad Air is Starlight, but I do like most of the colors there, but beyond the color selection, the smart connector on the back is on a different spot, and the iPad 10 is a touch thicker at 7 millimeters versus 6.1 on the Air. The reason the 10th gen iPad is a bit thicker than the Air is because the Air has a laminated display where the iPad 10 doesn't. Essentially what that means is all the components of the screen are fused together on the Air and it's a lot more dense. Well, the regular iPad, there's just a touch more separation between the touch surface and the actual screen. The LCD screens on both devices are pretty much identical. They're both 1640 by 2360 liquid retina IPS panels. Both have 500 nits peak brightness, with the only difference being that the Air has P3 wide color and the iPad 10 has sRGB. Now, that just means that the Air can technically display a broader range of color, but Honestly, they're almost indistinguishable from one another. The one thing that you can notice is the glass that sits over top. The Air has an anti-reflective coating where the regular iPad does not, so maybe that's a slight factor when looking at these, but I think the biggest thing here is that extra millimeter of thickness. That might seem like next to nothing, but there is definitely a noticeable difference using the Apple Pencil on the Air versus the regular iPad. It feels a bit more natural on the air because it's almost like you're writing on the surface where the regular iPad, you can notice that separation between the screen and the touch surface just a little bit more. That can be a factor if you're using this for creative work a lot, like drawing or graphic design. You definitely would have a better experience with the air in that regard, not only with the laminated display, but with the pencil itself. The second generation pencil can only be used with the iPad Air and the Pro models, where you'll have to use the first gen pencil with the iPad 10. Now that's unfortunate considering the second gen pencil is a bit lighter and it just clips on and charges wirelessly. The first gen pencil uses a lightning port to charge and if you take a close look at this, this is USB-C, so you're gonna have to buy a dongle to make it work with the iPad 10. But what I would suggest for most people, if you don't care about pressure sensitivity in the pencil, is just to buy a third party pencil like the one that I have here, which will work really well on either of these tablets. And these are only about 30 bucks. I find I don't like pressure sensitivity sometimes anyways. I just feel like sometimes you have to press fairly hard to get the results that you want. And something about pressing down hard on a display just feels wrong. It doesn't really affect anything like note taking in my opinion. And the nice thing about these, besides the fact that they're much cheaper, is they have USB-C charge ports. So you can just use a regular iPad charge cable to charge these up. I'll link all these pencil options in the description below. But another thing that I wanted to briefly touch on in relation to this is case and keyboard combos. Because it is important to note some of the differences there, especially on the iPad 10. So Apple sells a magic keyboard folio for the iPad 10 and beyond it being pretty expensive at $249, there's nowhere for me to slide in or attach the pencil. And while I was playing around with one in store, it just felt pretty underwhelming. What I would suggest for both the iPad 10 and the Air is one of these Logitech combo touch cases that are a fraction of the cost. And the iPad 10 version, they actually have a place to slide in your pencil, which is really handy if you're using this and you're mobile. I've been using this particular combo touch case first on my fourth gen Air and now on my fifth gen for about two years or so, and it's still going strong. 
And for me, it's probably the best value buy out there, just over $150 or so. The keyboard is fully removable and the stand portion goes back way further than on a lot of other models, which is great if you want to use this for drawing or note taking. Just coming back to why you can clip a pencil onto the iPad 10 like you can in the air and why it doesn't offer wireless charging. That's in large part because on the iPad 10, the front facing camera is in the center when holding this in landscape mode where all the magnets and wireless coils would normally be on the other iPad models. In my opinion, this is a much nicer natural camera placement than on the Air or any other iPad. If you're doing any kind of video messaging or Zoom calls, landscape is the ideal placement, especially if you've got this in a kickstand case where on every other iPad, it's centered in portrait mode. It's almost always sitting off to the side, which is usually pretty annoying and doesn't look great. The cameras themselves are pretty much identical to each other on both the front and the back specs wise. They've got the same microphones and in all the testing that I've done, it's produced very similar results on both models. So this is the iPad 10. I've got this in landscape mode on the front facing camera, which obviously you'll be using if you're doing any kind of video chatting or anything like that. But this is what it looks like and sounds like. So let's compare to the iPad Air 5. This is the iPad Air 5 and as you can tell right away, I'm kind of off to the side. I am holding it in landscape mode. So because that camera is off on the edge of the screen, it's just a very unnatural position. But this is what it looks like and sounds like. I thought that they might process photos or videos different just because they do have different chipsets in here, but that doesn't really seem to be the case. And the same goes for just everyday tasks. The things like browsing the web, checking emails, that kind of thing, you're likely not gonna notice any difference there either. The iPad 10 has the A14 Bionic chip where the iPad Air 5 has the M1 and both are more than capable of handling anything like that. The same goes for things like viewing content, watching Netflix, or your streaming service of choice. The only real difference that I notice is the speakers on the iPad 10 don't get quite as loud and they don't seem to have as much depth as in the air, but the picture and the performance with those things are pretty much identical. When it comes to games, again, both are great. I can see a slight improvement in frame rate on the M1 iPad Air, which is the most noticeable in graphically demanding games and in benchmarks where you see about twice the performance under heavy load, but just casually gaming on either of these from anything in the Apple Arcade, they're very similar. The M1 is technically a lot more capable with an eight core GPU with only four cores on the A14. And while you don't really notice it in a lot of games available on iPad, there are some instances where this makes a pretty huge difference. If you're a content creator, you can still use photo editing software, all right, most of the time on the iPad 10, unless you're working on really large files with lots of layers. But with any kind of video work, there are some pretty big limitations on the regular iPad versus the Air. That's not only to do with the reduced processing power in the A14, but the iPad 10 does only have four gigs of RAM where the Air has eight, and the Air has a dedicated media engine where the iPad 10 does not. You'll notice with things like DaVinci Resolve and other editors, while it's still technically possible to use them, you're often limited to 1080p timelines and the overall experience is just not that great. Both iPads offer the same storage options with the same drive speeds, which I don't particularly like. I've said this before, but I think there should be a 128 gig option as a base for both of these. 64 is just really small, so if you're doing any kind of video editing, storing a lot of games or apps, you do need a lot more space than 64 gigs. You can kind of remedy that by using an external drive if you want, because these do both have USB-C, but it doesn't really make sense to do on the iPad 10. The USB-C port only has drive speeds capable of 480 megabits per second, so we're talking USB 2.0 speeds, where the Air has 10 gigabit speeds, which is actually usable. And that can run drives like the SanDisk one to its full potential. That speed limitation on the port and reduced memory also restricts access to things like external monitor support. On the 10th gen iPad, you'll only be able to get 1080p at 60 hertz or 4K at 30 hertz, where the air will go all the way up to 6K at 60 hertz. Those resolutions on the 10 aren't great, but on top of that, you won't get access to stage manager on the iPad 10 like you will on the air. So while it can technically be hooked up to an external display, it's somewhat pointless in my opinion, as it'd just be mirroring what you already see on your iPad screen, and you get these really ugly bars on the side of your monitor. Stage Manager on the Air can be really handy in that it actually extends your display and makes the space functional. 
And you can use your iPad more like a computer or a desktop machine, and whether you like Stage Manager or not, it's just a lot more versatile in that regard. Now, during all this testing, I've been carefully paying attention to battery life, and this is something that I was really curious about because having owned the previous iPad Air, the fourth gen, I've always felt like that had a little bit better battery life than my M1 Air, and the iPad 10 does have the same chipset as that model. Both of these devices have exactly the same battery size and list the same battery life specs on Apple's website, and I did find that they are very similar. I think where I saw a bit of difference was the iPad 10 seems to conserve power better just running those low draw tasks like web browsing, but the M1 does a better job when the system resources are cranked up. When I was trying to edit video or run benchmarks on the A14 chip, it seemed to drain a bit faster than on the M1, but Overall, I don't think that there is a ton of difference, and I found the charge times to be about the same as well. One thing that probably makes the 10th gen iPad a bit more efficient is the Bluetooth is version 5.2 versus 5.0, that's on the Air. So if you do use Bluetooth devices a lot with your iPad, like headphones, and they run Bluetooth 5.2 and above, you might see a bit of a difference there. I'm not sure how much exactly, probably not a lot, but some nonetheless. As far as other wireless connections go, you're still gonna find the same Wi-Fi connectivity, the same 5G support, and if you're lucky enough and you live in the right country, both of these will have eSIM support if you choose options with cellular connectivity, otherwise you'll just have a regular nano SIM. So while there is quite a bit in here that is the same, there is a lot that is different. I'd say for me, diving into each device, I think there's a cutoff limit where it makes sense to get one of these over the other. If you're just using this casually around the house, browsing the web, checking email, playing Apple Arcade games and so on, the 10th gen iPad is where you wanna be. Even if you're using this for things like taking notes, writing documents, and maybe some light photo editing, you could probably still get by with the iPad 10, but beyond that, I don't think it makes much sense. Certainly, if you wanna do any kind of video editing, you wanna run Game Smoother, or you want access to Stage Manager or running external drives, and treat this more like a portable workstation, the iPad Air is a really good starting point that is a little bit cheaper than hopping into the Pro models. Like I said, I will leave links down below to everything that I mentioned in this video, but please leave a comment down below and let me know if you use a tablet, which one you use and what you use it for, or if you just have questions, that's okay too. If you enjoyed this video about large, expensive rectangles, hit that like button. If you want to see more tech-related content, or if you want to start a business with me selling jarred mountain air from the top of the Rocky Mountains, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next upload.